The good news is that the French language is alive and well in Ontario, with Francophone and Anglophone parents both wanting their children educated in full-time French language public schools. The bad news, some fear, is that it's altering the nature of those schools and not necessarily for the better. With us to dig into the details, in Disraeli, Quebec via Skype, José Gandon, parent and formerly a French language school supply teacher. From our studio at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Stéphanie Chouinard, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the Royal Military College and Queen's University. In Burlington, Ontario via Skype, May Dang, member of the Board of Directors for Canadian Parents for French and the parent of a child currently in the French language public school system. And here in our studio, Janet Ecker, former Progressive Conservative Minister of Education from 1999 to 2002, and Basile Dorian, former trustee for the Simcoe County District School Board. Bienvenue à tous. Welcome, everybody. It's good to have you all on TVO tonight. First off, and Stephanie, let me get you in here right off the top, because there's French immersion, there's core French, and then there's French language schools. And we're talking French language schools tonight, but it might be helpful if you just spend a, a brief time off the top here clarifying what the difference is among those three different things. Certainly. So when we talk about French core, we're talking about French that's being taught as a subject. So this is the uh, type of uh, French that uh, most Ontario students would have access to during primary and secondary education. French immersion teaches French as a subject, as a language, but also has a certain l number of subjects also taught in French. For example, history, Canadian history, but taught in French, and another uh, core of subjects that are being taught in English. So both of these schools uh, are uh, offered to majority Anglophone Ontarians. Now, when we talk about French language schools, those are the schools that are reserved, technically, at least, to uh, French language parents uh, to have their, their children taught fully in uh, the French language, except for English, which is being taught as a subject. And those schools are protected under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And those are the schools we're going to be talking about tonight. And just by way of background, let's add a, a few more numbers to what you've just put forward. There are apparently 455 of these schools across the province of Ontario. 350 in the elementary panel, 105 in the secondary panel. These French language schools are spread across four public school boards and eight Catholic school boards. Now, you did mention the Constitution at the end of that answer, Stephanie, and maybe we can pick up from there. Section 23 of the Charter, how does that factor into the discussion we're having tonight about French schools? So Section 23 essentially states the right for parents who have English or French as a first language to have their children taught in that language anywhere in the country. So that means that uh, schools for Anglophone parents in Quebec uh, is protected by the Charter and uh, Franco-Ontarians as well as Francophones anywhere in the country outside of Quebec also have the possibility to have their children uh, taught in, in those full French uh, programs. Uh, and so so this uh, restricts access to uh, full French schools to Anglophones uh, who technically are not entitled to, uh, to have their children taught in those schools by the Constitution. However, in a lot of provinces, such as in Ontario, the province itself uh, does not restrict access to French schools. It leaves that up to the school boards. Some other places in the country, like in Yukon, for example, are very strict about the admissions. And so uh, the, uh, the uh, territorial government will state express uh, what the Francophone School Board can and can't do with regards to admissions. José, let me get you to pick up the story. Since the French schools were established in the province of Ontario, how has the demand for that kind of education changed? I can say that it's been increasing significantly um, at least since the year 2011. And my recollection, Janet, is that it was uh, the Mike Harris government in 1997 that actually created French language school boards a couple of years before you became the Minister of Education. Do you know why that was done in the first place, to give this separate governance? Well, it was part of a, an overall uh, reform of how education was funded in Ontario. And there were two uh, major priorities, and one of them was to take some of the pressure off the property tax, because education was paid for largely through the property tax, and municipal politicians would be yelled at if it, you know, if it was going up, but they weren't the ones that were making the decisions. So there 
was a bit of an accountability mismatch there. But secondly, it was we we had an overall goal of trying to drive improved student performance. So what we wanted was funding for school boards that was more transparent, that gave more levers to drive quality education, and that protected uh, classroom spending versus administration spending. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to start wading into changing all of that, you quickly realize that there are constitutional realities that you have to pay attention to. And so there was a great deal of time and effort, and many lawyers, I'm sure, got very, very wealthy um, on the consulting fees to figure out how to do that in a way that didn't end up in the constitutional courts. So, because uh, we actually have, and what a lot of Ontarians don't know, is we actually have a four system system because there's French Catholic, French public, and then there's Catholic and public, as it were, right? English. So, yeah, English, yeah. there's four. And so, but we were trying to um, respect all of those constitutional rights. And, you know, there were a couple of court cases and things that, you know, because we were challenged, um, but we were able to proceed uh, proceed that. But it was, it was more about a broader policy objective for financial accountability and better student outcomes. Well, despite the work of those lawyers, the accountability in court may not be over yet because the fellow sitting beside me here has an idea oh, to get was, back into the courts. Every, every year there would be an issue from either one of the French boards or the Catholic boards because it was important and, and the word we always used was equitable, right? Like mm -hmm. you had to have, it wasn't equal, but it was equitable. And there would always be an issue every year. They would come forward to the government and there would be something that they didn't think was equitable. And so there would be discussions, negotiations or whatever, and we'd figure something out and everybody would carry on until the next year. Well, Basile, let me get you to pick up the story in as much as, as Stephanie indicated, Indicated, those French schools are first and foremost for French speaking kids whose parents are French. They're for Francophones. But there are increasing numbers of English kids for whom English is the first language but whose French is apparently good enough that they can attend these schools too. You're concerned about that. How come? Well, uh, let's, uh, I'd like to point out first that in 1999, we got caught up in these monstrous geographical French language boards. Uh, on the public side, it was like people in the Penetanguishi in Midland area, all the way to Windsor, Toronto, were all regrouped in one board. That's a very large geographical area. But uh, yes, we have obtained our schools and uh, over the years, some of them uh, quite uh, difficult uh, at times, especially at the secondary level. What's the difficulty? But my concern is that the, the, the French language schools exist firstly for those who uh, enter under the constitutional thing that are French speakers, French parents, and all that. We already have a very difficult problem of anglicization with that. And sometimes when you put too many, uh, too large numbers of Anglophones in the system, it waters it down. Uh, and I'm not saying that this is a, uh, that we are against Anglophone, it's just that our survival is at risk and that uh, we are very concerned. Well, here uh, are the numbers. Let me put these up right now. Uh, Sheldon, I'm calling an audible on you here. Let's go to the top of page five, because here's why, yes, thank you. Here's why uh, Basile is concerned. And for those listening on podcast, I'll read out the numbers here. If you go back about a decade to the 2010-2011 academic year, the proportion of students who are Anglophones, but who were good enough speaking French to warrant being in the French language school system, was about a third, 34.8%. But it increases every year to the point where for the 2017-18 school year, We've got 45.3% of the students now in the French language school system for whom English is actually their first, I guess, mother tongue is the way to put it, 45.3%. That is a concern for you, Basile? Yes, it is, because uh, we've obtained their French language school boards. And if I become a minority in the, my own francophone school board as a rate payer, then my right under the Constitution to manage our school boards is uh, watered uh, away. Okay, so that's one concern, but it goes much further than that. Uh, let's go to May in Burlington, because you are an Anglophone parent. You've got a son in a French language school, and I wonder if I could get you to speak to the concern that Basile has just advanced. 
I, I actually um, do echo the concerns of, of uh, Mr. Bazile in, in that, you know, you the intention is that you send your children to uh, a, 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 an all French school board um, so that they would um, learn French and improve on their French. And I do hear um, uh, English, um, you know, you know, amongst when I when I see my son speaking to his peers. Um, but I but I feel that the solution should not be exclusion of the um, Anglophone community or non-French speaking community, but more of, you know, having a partnership between parents and um, teachers to really promote the outside of school exposure to French. What I mean by this is that um, while I'm not a Francophone, nor is my husband, I've worked really hard to learn the French language. I purposely moved to Montreal to learn French for nine years. And I'm now at a, at, a, at a capacity where I can communicate in French. I sit on the parent count, well, I sat on the camp parent council last year and, um, you know, promoted, um, you know, having movie nights so that, um, you know, families and children can come together and have these experiences so that learning French is not just within their schools. It is applicable to um, outside activities um, by my we still have a lot of friends and families that um, are in Montreal and so we visit them a lot so my my son sees um, uh, French uh, being um, used um, by his um, by his friends by my friends and also that um, when we go to for instance um, I had attended the um, uh, Official Languages Act uh, 50th anniversary in Ottawa. We had, um, you know, purposely went to visit the Senate um, and, and got a tour of it all in French. It mm. was, it, you know, my I had to do translation for my mom, but we purposely did that so that my son could have that outside exposure. And this is what needs to take place: not exclusion, but more of, um, you know, creating an environment where. French exists outside of the schools. Okay, understood, May. Let me get another perspective now from Jose. And Jose, let me just set this up by saying uh, you were a student in the French language school system, is that right? I was a student, I was also a substitute teacher, and my children have attended two years uh, in the same French education system as I was. Okay, so yes. you, know this, you know this system very well. What's your take on the debate that we're having tonight? Um, personally, I believe that um, there, I do um, understand the inclusion part of uh, the whole system, but at the same time, um, as a French minority, I'm very concerned about what's happening. So my concern as, as a parent uh, and is the academic success that's being um, impacted as a result of the increase of English in, in the French language schools. Okay, let me get some feedback on that. I want to go to Janet first and then Stephanie. If, if you're the Minister of Education, as you once were, and you're trying to find the sweet spot between making sure that the French language system is truly French uh, versus the fact that a lot of Anglophones who are capable of speaking French want to go there, but that may affect the actual Frenchness of the school system, how do you find that sweet spot that's going to satisfy everybody well I think I think that's a big challenge actually and and I don't know what the magical solution is is because you have one of those uh, wonderful things that happens in public policy where you've got this person's rights are clashing with that person's rights and I think when the system was originally set up I think there was a sense that um, having the, the panels decide who should be allowed into the school because you didn't want to sort of say to the school boards no you know you can't you have no authority in terms of who walks into your school I think at the time seem to be the right way to do this. Um, the challenge that this, this, this system, the whole governance structure the system has had, I think, since day one, is that because, uh, uh, you know, again, of the geographic distances that have been mentioned, uh, the critical mass that, that just hasn't been there, trying to maintain and build quality in the two French systems has been a challenge since day one. And I'm hoping, like, one of the solutions might be uh, to try and, and do more to get more um, French language instruction, more teachers who are capable of either who are francophones who can go into teaching or anglophones who can learn how to be very very good french instruction and and i get very much that there's a there's a big difference between being able to just speak a language and understand and culturally you know uh, 
have that language. Um, there's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, um, the problem that, that I've heard people discuss yeah. is that is that with 45% of the kids in the French language school system being Anglophone, yeah. if you go outside at recess, those kids are speaking English. Yeah. And that doesn't keep the yeah. kind of the French character of the school system. But I think one of the things, and I don't know if this would ever happen, but I think one of the problems is that we're, everyone is so concerned about, and I understand that, protecting rights, that you kind of need to say, okay, can we just have a conversation amongst all the players? Let's set the constitutional stuff outside the door for a minute. And are there some practical solutions that might help? I don't know, but um, one of the problems in this area is you keep tripping over, if I can put it that way, um, constitutional rights that, that the different groups have. The other challenge, of course, these days, um, which didn't exist as much in the 90s, but certainly is a major challenge today, is just the multicultural diversity of Ontario society. Because there are many parents who are saying, excuse me, I mean, this is cool, French, English, whatever, um, but they want a school system uh, that is more respectful of their particular language or their particular multicultural background. So that starts Which is to not constitutionally protected, no, that's, however. Yes, that's quite right. But um, uh, I must say... But may have greater numbers. Political pressure. Right, we get that. Absolutely. We get so, that. Okay, Stephanie, yeah. let's go to you uh, in uh, Kingston and have you weigh in on this issue of how you find the sweet spot between, you know, the, the, the facts on the ground and what the Constitution may say. So I think we're looking at a two-pronged uh, type of problem here. So from uh, one end, uh, you're absolutely correct that uh, the Constitution acts as a constraint. So when we look at the letter of the law, what it says is that one parent out of presumably two, uh, at least, uh, need to be francophone in order for the children to have access to uh, francophone schools. Well, the majority of Franco-Ontarians today are in exogamous relationships, which means that uh, the second parent is usually not French as a first uh, language, at least. So that causes issues, at, uh, at least with respect to uh, what is the language most spoken at home. And uh, obviously, in minority situations, parents may have uh, strong amounts of goodwill, uh, but sometimes what happens is that um, the language of the home will be uh, English rather than French. And so that causes some of the issues that we're seeing with, uh, with children uh, having English as a first, uh, as a first, as a mother tongue uh, in the French schools. Those kids are still rights bearers according to the Constitution. The other problem with the way that the law is written, and this actually comes back to the issue of multiculturalism, because multiculturalism also happens in French, is that we have a lot of newcomers coming from Ontario. According uh, to the law, they shouldn't have access to French school because they weren't taught as a first language in French in their home country. But if you look at all of the north of Africa, for example, where Arabic may have been the first official language there, uh, oftentimes the parents will have French as a second language. And they arrive in Ontario and they realize that uh, they can make sure that uh, their children actually become bilingual by having access to French schools. If you look at Section 23, it's quite unclear that these parents actually have the right to send their kids to French schools. Uh, but in Ontario, thankfully, I think uh, we allow um, the school boards to make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. So that's the first part of the problem, that the Constitution is perhaps um, a little bit more restrictive than it should be, and uh, at the same time allows uh, children that put pressure on the French system because they don't speak French at home. And on the other hand, some children who do speak French at home are not fully recognized by the law. On the other hand, you have um, school boards that are vying for numbers. Mm -hmm. And this is the case for French as well as English school boards, that there's a certain amount of per capita funding that comes from the number of kids you have in your schools. And so this creates competition among the school boards, especially in rural areas where we're trying to keep as many, uh, as many uh, children in our schools as possible. And so uh, obviously, that creates a situation where uh, French school boards are enticed in uh, admitting more students maybe than they should uh, with respect to if you're stri strictly look at, looking at uh, the, uh, the, the amount of French language that is spoken in their homes. Sure. Let me get uh, some reaction then uh, from Basile and then José on the following question. If you're concerned that the French language school system is becoming too watered down by too many Anglophones being in that system, should we just... Should we just do this? Should we just say maximum one-third Anglophone kids in the French school system and that's it? Or do you want to ban Anglophone kids in the French school system? Do you want to do that? 
Uh, not necessarily. I commend uh, May for doing what she is doing as a parent. Unfortunately, not all parents are that committed. If all the parents were committed that way, then the situation would be much different. The problem with including everyone is that in the end, somebody gets excluded. And what happens in our French language school, and I heard this on the weekend from a student, uh, a parent, whose student is the only one in her class that can understand French in kindergarten. And uh, so what does that student do? Hansel, I'm sorry, this is a French language school? This is a French language where, school. Where this happens all the time Where only regularly. one kid can understand where French? one or it? two kids in the whole classroom understand French when they get in there. In a French language school? In a French language school. So we have challenges that are unimaginable. And this is what's hard to get across sometimes because, um, so in that case, often those Francophone students get excluded from the group because they are different. They don't fit in the majority, so they get excluded for the, gr for, for the group. Even though technically Or they assimilate and start doing the same huh. thing as the English kids. Even though it's technically so, their school. Pardon? Even though technically it's their school. Yes, exactly. Okay, Jose, follow up on that if you would, please. What, what, what do you think about the notion of saying we're going to have a cutoff? Only a third of the students can be Anglophone. Or, or do you want to go for an outright ban to in ensure the Frenchness of the French language school system? I wouldn't uh, go either way. Um, first, I want to say that my kids um, have attended a French language school in Ontario, and they were the only, I have twins, and they were the only ones in their class as well that spoke French. The rest, um, French was their second language that they were about to learn. Um, so for me, from my experience, I learned that um, we have to base our the education system on quality and not on quantity. So by increasing the amount of students, by diluting, as you say, um, that is to the detriment of the French first language people. So I believe that some kind of a separation would be the best way to go. So offering first language education for first language students and second language French for second language students. May, I wonder if I could ask you whether or not you feel some sympathy for the Francophone members who are with us tonight who are worried that they are losing, you know, the French quality of the French language school system because there's too many Anglophones in it. You know, I, I, I completely understand where they're coming from. I, I, I do that. I, I completely understand because my background is that I'm Vietnamese and Chinese and I have 30-something first cousins, um, many of which were um, born here in Canada, and most of them don't speak our mother tongue. So I, I totally understand how hard it is to maintain language and culture. Um, I, I think that one of the, the things to, to really keep in mind is that there's an assumption that um, first language um, uh, or French speaking parents will um, be able to motivate their children to uh, be proficient in French. And that is a strong assumption because based on what I've seen, and especially um, as um, Jose had pointed out, when you have exonerous um, uh, couples where uh, there's 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 um, some a parent that is a Francophone and a parent that's not Francophone, sometimes their children don't speak French. And this is what we witnessed even in my son's school board where he was put into a French daycare at 13 months and he was he was able to compile sentences and fully understand directives when he went into um, JK. But some of his peers, including children of Francophone uh, families, didn't have that proficiency. So, you know, it, 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 the, the exclusion needs to be needs to be revisited because if you're only thinking about um, um, you know francophone families then you are also excluding out those that try really hard to get their children to a level um, that is promoting what what the francophone agenda you know, is. I take your right? point, I take your point, but I gather in, in your own city, in Burlington, there, there have been attempts to get a French high school there, a French language right. high school, but they haven't got the numbers for it. Exactly. So I sit on that 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 committee um, with um, I, there's I believe there's about seven um, of us on on the team, and half of us are Francophone 
Francophiles, les, les Francophiles, not Francophones. Yes, and Francophiles, so, you love French. Exactly. So, so, so we support the mandate to have um, a, a, a French high school in Burlington because what happens is that children after grade six, after all their years of, of learning French as a first language, they end up dropping out. And what a shame that is. And so, so we're promoting this agenda, and I, I, I'm a part of these parents who are not francophones as well, um, but sit on that committee with francophones. We have our meetings, um, well, at the parent council, it is all in French because it's part of the school, um, but at the subcommittee um, uh, to, to, um, uh, to push for a, a high school in Burlington, Ontario, we have to do it bilingually. Um, and that's that's to accommodate in order to get the numbers. Otherwise, we won't have the facilities or the institutions needed to continue to allow our children to continue in French. Gotcha. Let me, uh, Basile, uh, just want to read this quote here because because you're you're at the point now where you're thinking of challenging the status quo in court because yeah. you're losing the Frenchness of your school system in your view. And here's what Randall Denley, who's a former Tory candidate actually for office here in the province, had to say about all this. He says, if Dorian's court challenge succeeds, it could collapse Ontario's educational house of cards. A decision that boards have to stick only to those they were created to serve would have major implications for the Catholic system too. This would pose an interesting dilemma for the Ontario government. As irrational as Ontario's school system is, Politicians of all parties realize it is suicide to change it. Uh, Janet, I want your thoughts on this as somebody who had to deal with this issue once upon a time. Uh, is it a house of cards that this guy is on the verge of collapsing? It, well, it could be, and, and that's not, that may not be fair, but that's reality. And let's go back to the kindergarten class that Basile was talking about, where only two or three children within that class were actual, quote, real francophones. How can you run a system with a class of two. With three, two or three, right? And that's the reality. And and I know, you know, some will say, well, more money will solve it. Well, it's not just more money. I mean, more money won't be able to solve it because there's already pressures. Always, there's always pressures for more funding within the educational system. So as I said, I mean, to me, the only option is to to as I said, let's just check the constitutional realities at the door and sit down in a room and see if there are any practical solutions. There may not be. I don't know, but opening up an, another fight around religion and race. I mean, Ontario has been very, very lucky in our history that we haven't had some of the divisions that other societies have had on these very, very important, I mean, these are real cleavages in societies, right? And, and you say, oh, well, it would never happen here. Well, there's a lot of things that people said would never happen in their jurisdiction. So I think we play with this issue. It's like playing with fire, and that may not be fair to all of the rights that are involved in this, but, um, yeah, it would be very difficult for well, any government to deal Basile, with. Basile, you would acknowledge you can't have a kindergarten class with two children in it. I know that. Okay. But this house of cards falling apart mm -hmm. is a gross exaggeration of the situation. It is definitely not that way. I think it's being misinterpreted. <clears throat> the, the problem is not just the admission of Anglophones or not rights bank. That's only a very small part of a much larger problem that I call the numbers game is that when we speak about those kids that don't speak English, when uh, they don't speak French when they come into, they are not just Anglophones. They come from rights-bearing Francophones who do not speak French to their kids at home. So we definitely have a big challenge there. That's the responsibility of our school officials to do their job and uh, to do that. It's also the responsibility of the Ministry of Education to understand that and not push them to have this numbers because everybody is geared on this numbers, 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 and it's not helping us. We have the separate fighting against the public for students. Mm -hmm. We're, uh, some of our French schools are fighting against immersion schools because they want the students there. And <clears throat> so the problem, the Anglophones are just a very small part of of a much bigger problem. Well, let me pick we up need on that. to have proactivity on our part of our school board trustees uh, to uh, be much more proactive, but they don't want to do that. They're scared to lose one student, Stephanie, and that's the if problem. You parents, okay. If you have parents who, aren't, who are Francophone parents who are not speaking to their children in French, 
a government, what are you going to do? Force them? I mean, you can't, you know, like there's, I'm, there's some realities here that um, we have to deal with, right? And, and again, I, I don't know what the magic solution is, but that forcing them to speak French to their kids if they don't think it's important. Is not a solution. No, not a solution. Stephanie, let me get you in here because we, we, we've talked about the fact that there are lots of Anglophone kids now in the French language system. There are also lots of non-Catholic kids in the Catholic school system. And I wonder if you could sort of, you know, it's been described by Randall as a house of cards. Can you, can you sort of imagine where this house of cards may be taking us down the road, given how fragmented things are increasingly becoming? So it's interesting to look at what's been done elsewhere in provinces where, despite the fact that Section 93 of the Constitution Act 1867 once upon a time applied everywhere in the country, some provinces have decided to do away with separate school systems. Uh, and so uh, in New Brunswick, for example, there is a French language and an English language uh, system. And, uh, and it creates the situation where you don't need to divide all the resources. Um, some uh, school boards have become quite creative in Ontario. I know on the French side, for example, uh, new schools that are being built are being built by both uh, the separate Catholic school board and the public school board. And so they can uh, share some, uh, some of the parts of the institution, uh, the gymnasium, the library, for example, but they have their own separate classes. So this is one way that uh, you can sort of come around uh, the system, especially when you have an issues with with, uh, you have issues with uh, with numbers and with having the infrastructure uh, for uh, for all the kids that is equitable uh, to uh, the type of infra infrastructure that you find in English school boards, um, but that doesn't work everywhere, of mm. course. Um, I mean, but those it's are interesting to see that in Ontario, the question of Catholic school boards is so charged, and uh, that uh, politicians are very wary to tackle it. Well, yeah, but those are that's an example of the sort of practical solutions that I think <clears> can work. And I know in my riding, one of the the the, the big sort this of is Ajax yeah Pickering. Ajax Pickering. We had a high school that the the two board the Catholic and the the public board built a a wonderful new state of the art high school that they shared. You know they couldn't have afforded it on their own, but they were able to do it together. So it gets me back to the practical. The other option, um, and again this is just as controversial as anything else, would be to say to parents um, in a multicultural society, we're going to look at options that give you the chance to have smaller schools. So that gets you into things like charter schools, which people will go ballistic over, or special funding, you know, to, that follows the child with the parent if they want to send to this school over that school. Well, we have African-Canadian uh, specialty yeah. schools, Indigenous specialty That's right. schools. You know, That's it's right. It's not unprecedented. And it's not unprecedented, and if it's done right, you can have quality education, and it, it's another potential solution, it's not the only solution, hmm. to the kind of challenge that the Francophone community is facing. Jose, do you, do you see this taking us sort of inexorably towards one unified school system where you have you know one level of governance and you don't have four separate boards english catholic french catholic etc cetera, etc cetera. well i feel that the french system should be divided into a first language and a second language so whether it's in the one same school institution or in separate ones depending on the context some geograph geographical areas have french communities so they would be able to have their own be large enough to have their own schools but some of the areas where the numbers are, are lower uh, you know they could do split classes my children are in grade two in quebec in a very small 75 student um, school and they're doing grade one two three together so there's possibilities for split classes um, there's also possibilities to have you know a French first language wing or a section of the school where there's second language, uh, fr French second language students in the second second part of the same school, so they could share resources, as Stephanie explained. I don't feel like blaming the victim is the way to go, um, as we all know. Uh, with you know assimilation has been happening, so a lot of you know a lot of families have lost their French. And now we're at a point where the percentage is at 4% of the population in Ontario are French. So to turn around and say, well, because their numbers are so low, uh, we shouldn't be offering them, uh, you know, their education because they're in an area where there's not many of them. Well, the reason for that is because of the assimilation that's been happening since the beginning of the century. Mm. A great so. and difficult issue, and I'm afraid that's our time. Mr. Director, would you put up a shot of everybody, please, so I can thank Basile mm -hmm. Dorian, Janet Ecker, Stephanie Chouinard, May Dang, and José Gendon, 
all of whom have been on the agenda tonight. We're grateful for your time. Merci beaucoup, tout le monde. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.